and welcome to my channel Haley Marie Vintage. Today we are headed to New York. This is kind of part two of a essentially four part travel vlog series. The first two are proper vlogs where I took you to Philadelphia on Tuesday. Today I'm taking you to New York and then in a few weeks I'm going to give you a haul of all the fabric I brought home from the fabric district and all the vintage I brought back from vintage shopping. So we have a great few weeks of content ahead. Between that will be all my sewing and usual and I know vlog style videos aren't for everybody here on this channel so if you skip them I'm not offended. I will see you next week for another sewing video. I have some great sewing projects coming up. So I went ahead and I put every single place I went to on a map and I'm going to link that map down below. It's a google map. If you're planning a trip to New York you can just like pull those pins and make your own map and stuff like that. So that will be linked down below. But with that we're going to go ahead and jump into the footage. Once I arrived in New York I took a taxi to my hotel. They were already ready even though I was early but I will say even though I thought the some of the service at this hotel was really good I don't know that I would highly recommend it. I do think the room is quite spacious for New York. I just it has that waterfall shower thing that I hate and it had no hot water or coffee maker in the room or mini fridge and that just all causes various problems for me because I'm somebody who likes to eat my leftovers to save a little bit of money. So I don't know that I would recommend this hotel but it wasn't bad either so if it's the right price at the right time I think you should do it. Then I went to read and eat some food at a restaurant that was close by. All right so you've seen like three seconds of footage I feel like because it was just my hotel and the first meal I ate in New York. For the hotel I just kind of wanted to get into my further thoughts on that. I kind of felt like the pricing for my hotel was slightly deceptive because I was looking for pricing via like Wikipedia and they have a price per night but then on top of that they have a $40 facility fees that you can't see when you're looking at like those all up prices so it makes the hotel appear cheaper than it is and I find that kind of frustrating and that $40 utility fee supposedly covered breakfast but like when I came down to ask about breakfast it seems like no one knew what I was talking about and it was a very weird experience the amenities fees basically was like for breakfast two bottles of water in your room hot tea anytime you go downstairs or coffee and then there was like a remote work room and exercise room and a pool what was a big deal was the fact that yeah no one seemed to be able to tell me where I could find breakfast or how breakfast worked and then I really really hated not having a mini fridge or like hot water maker or anything in my room and aside from that this like boutique hotel was like our thing is our rooms are like one of a kind and everyone is decorated differently and if by decorations they mean lighting fixtures I guess there was no art in the room which I thought was weird which is a weird critique but like if you're gonna say you're a boutique hotel with like a unique room I feel like there should be unique art and God knows there's plenty of art in Brooklyn that you can purchase from. It was fine. I will say like the rooms were a good size. I could easily walk around my room. There was easily a place for me to put my suitcase in my room. And so like that's a big deal for New York. I don't think I would stay in the hotel again and I don't know how much I would recommend it to people because of just like those things. Also it was a four star hotel and I just like don't, this sounds like so snobby of me, but I don't feel like I got a four star hotel experience. I feel like I was getting like a three star hotel experience. Also Williamsburg as a neighborhood hood was maybe not quite my cup of tea it seemed very like hipstery which now like I have found out I guess it's like the hipster capital of the world so that's on me for not knowing that I stayed there because my friend lives pretty close by although she lives in more of like a neighborhoody neighborhood and the neighborhood was fine it's just I think it was like not my neighborhood if that makes sense I think next time I'll definitely stay in Manhattan proper uh, that's kind of my thoughts on the hotel but now we'll switch back into I go to work the next day and then after work I'm gonna head and do a couple different things after getting off work I stopped by a pharmacy that had a specific type of cough drop I like just to stash like I'm not even sick but then I headed to Central Park from there because it was really close by I missed my bus stop so I had to walk just as far as if I had not taken the bus so that was a bit of a bummer however I was impressed with the bus in New York but first we're walking by like the Swedish cottage here I mainly headed to Belvedere Castle for the views I thought it would be kind of fun so here is a view up from the top. This is the back side where you can kind of see some buildings in a distance. This is looking north. And then now we're looking west. 
And then there's the plaza I was just in. I want to show you how narrow the stairway is here. I'm going to real quick go down the stairs. So you had to like use mirrors essentially to see if people were coming down because you can only have one person on the stairs at a time. So this did take some like, I want to say social navigating, but that's not quite the right term. That was just the view from the bottom level. This is the top level. This attraction is completely free, which I was confused on. Didn't know I planned on paying and then I didn't have to and I was pretty excited. There is like a limit I think to how many people can be up here at a time So there are people like guiding you through all that But yeah, this was very fun and if you're gonna go through Central Park I think it's well worth going up to the top of this castle just to do something a little bit different Seattle does get a lot of tourists from other countries, but definitely not nearly as New York. It was fun to hear on the top of this tower. I heard at least four different languages being spoken. Overall, New York was just cool because it's definitely the most languages I have heard spoken in a city in America. They're known for that. They're known for their language diversity, but I, I love hearing language diversity. And there's a lot of Spanish spoken in New York, so I actually got to brush up some Spanish skills, not by talking to anyone in Spanish, but by uh, eavesdropping on people of Spanish, which is not great, but I am honestly a chronic eavesdropper, so it is what it is. From here, on my way back down, I thought I'd take you through the Shakespearean garden. We are in very early spring, so pretty much all that's up is daffodils, but I do love daffodils, so there's nothing wrong with that. I definitely loved this area of Central Park. It was just very picturesque and fun. I did not do the whole meal deal on Central Park, walking the whole thing, because I was definitely not wearing the correct shoes. I was wearing my American duchesses and I definitely shouldn't have. I moved to sneakers for the rest of this trip because my American duchesses were not doing it this time. But as you can see, a lot of flowers, also a lot of cobblestones, definitely almost turned an ankle. But this is just very picturesque. I would love to see this in like peak spring bloom. I'm sure it's really beautiful. And from here, I am heading down towards the lake where you can see just a nice cityscape bridge situation. I was not yet like overstimulated by New York, so this, I could have probably done this a little later, but it's okay, because while it was a nice day out, it was cold enough that people weren't really out and about, so that worked out for me, because things were a little quieter. I'm just kind of wandering about, seeing the sights. This is, I believe, like a gazebo, Victorian gazebo, or something like that. It is really interesting to have such a big park in the middle of so many tall buildings. And here's a first view of the bridge. What's really funny is I realized a huge amount of my sense Central Park imagery or footage or things that I recognize, I recognized from Gossip Girl, which is hilarious. I definitely feel like I just remember a lot of Blair Waldorf and Central Park plotting things. Is this just me? What movie or show is your like Central Park thing. Here's the Bethesda Terrace, which this was like the most Gossip Girl feeling thing for me of all. Just really funny. I think this is the first time I've been in a place and my mind has instantly gone to a TV show. Even though I've been to Rome and seen a lot of sites from like the Lizzie McGuire movie, there's just something about this area that like instantly I was like, oh my god, I'm in Gossip Girl. I will say the Bethesda Terrace was incredible to see. Obviously it's winter so the fountain's not on. There's just something just so big and iconic about it to me. I sat in this little area for a bit because my feet were quite unhappy with the decisions I had been making. But after this, I got back on the subway to head back to Brooklyn. On my way off the subway while getting kind of lost on my way to try to get boba tea, I stumbled across this mother of junk shop that was really really cute they had a lot of really interesting things so i took a quick perusal in here and i did pick something up but i think this would be a great place to stop in if you're looking for something kind of like weird but specific at the same time as far as like craft supplies there's a certain parts of the store that kind of reminded me of like a creative reuse center the thing i was most excited about was the tins but they also had lots of fun things like really old bottles and stuff like that. Old bottles are not quite my thing, but I did enjoy quickly looking at them. After going to the FIT Museum, I went to a couple fabric shops. This first one is B&J Fabrics, which their fabrics are on, I think they're called like header cards. So you kind of just flip through them like you would clothing to see what you're looking for. This was very, very organized, very well categorized. For me, it's just that the prices felt too high for the, what the fabric is. Like not that 
these fabrics aren't beautiful, but I know I can find them for like something similar for a better price somewhere else. But I did really enjoy looking through them and I do still highly recommend stopping here. One of the biggest reasons I stopped here was for this beaded fabric and a couple other beaded fabrics. I had seen these online and I just wanted to see them in person and see how like I generally felt about them. They look great, but I wasn't gonna buy anything here until I had looked around at more shops since we're super early in the shopping experience here. But look at how really, really cool some of these are. And then here I am at a trim store. This trim store is so fun. There were so many feather options and like different types of feathers. I was very tempted because I am looking for feathers for the one dress I'm making. So it was good to see a ton of different types of feathers all in a row. I do still think I wanna go with the original intent to use ostrich feathers and it was I guess good to like confirm that. Also there were just a gajillion rhinestones and it was so fun to look at everything in this shop. There were tons of fringes as well and all sorts of goodies. I was on the lookout for some beaded fringe so this was a good shop to be looking at and they also had any type of binding, piping, rickrack, lace, beaded trim, Anything you wanted, I feel like they had here. It was pretty wild. And then my next stop was Pacific Trimming and Buttons. So here, obviously, they have a lot of trims and they have a lot of buttons. I came here primarily to look at some of their handbag handles. I maybe regret not picking some up, but that's fine. And then I did look through some of their laces and things. They did have some pretty laces, but ultimately, like, nothing that was quite what I was looking for. And then they also had, like, a million gajillion buttons, but luckily, I am all good on buttons, so I was not too tempted by this. My, after my second day of work, I mentioned that I headed up to the FIT Museum. I don't know what I was thinking. I only took photos there. I didn't take any video footage, so I'm just going to kind of run you through what I saw there. So I'm going to open my own photo library. I was excited because the two exhibits they had on display there were sleeves and bows. And if you've seen me so, you know that I love sleeves and you know that I love bows. So I was pretty excited that these were the exhibits that I got to see while I was there. They did have active classes going through so that was like a bit of a bummer because they were packed. In the bow part of the exhibit I don't know what I was expecting but I was maybe expecting something a little bit more exciting. This was the smaller of the two exhibits and I saw some fun things like some corset like lots of bow accessories. They had some really nice like old pieces but what I liked the most is there was like this beautiful white suit that you can tell is for a woman and it has like a little bow tie and it's just it's it's a really stunning piece that I found pretty inspiring and and a white suit is not for me because my hair will bleed on that, but it does have me thinking of ways I can kind of mimic this silhouette because I thought it was absolutely stunning. Another thing they had, they had like this beautiful kind of trench coaty thing with a bow on it that again I thought was really really stunning and definitely had my wheels turning on how I could kind of make like a really girly raincoat. And then they featured some things like Lolita style, which is really cool. I feel like there's a lot of niches in style that aren't formally recognized, especially in Western society. So I thought it was really cool to see that in the exhibit. I don't want to say like not so cool example of the exhibit. I guess I would say more jarring. It was jarring to see some fast fashion in the exhibit. This is a Fenty by Puma or Puma and Fenty collabs sneaker. And Puma and Fenty are both brands riddled with human rights violations allegedly. So it was just like kind of jarring to see like something like this in contrast with like a pink polyester satin sneaker for me. It just feels weird in an exhibit with a bunch of other things. I did really enjoy they had this black dress with a big pink bow on the booty and I thought it was absolutely stunning. And then this was my favorite piece in the exhibit. It's a beautiful 1930s dress where they like cut out the bows on the fabric and used it to make these like textured details that I thought was absolutely stunning. I adored this dress. I love using bows in my work. I, I mean, I'm wearing a bow right now. So I was definitely inspired to think about how I could use fabric manipulation like that to just kind of like emphasize those bows in a fun way. I feel like everything I loved was the 30s. Those were all my favorite things in the exhibits. I feel like I'm in a very 30s mindset these days. And the last bow piece that I'm going to show you, it was like this big giant bow across the front of the dress like that. And I just thought it was really, really cool. I will say it was like hand painted silk satin and I didn't think the hand painting looked great, but you know, I, I have not hand painted silk. So who am I to judge? 
but that's that's kind of what I have to say about the bow exhibit. Despite my critique, I of course really enjoyed it. I mean, the reason I love to go to things like this is to think critically, and if I come out of the museum with no critical thoughts, the museum failed in my opinion. So next we go into the sleeve exhibit, and you first walk in, and there's this rainbow rack that you can see like the sleeves of garments from, and they kind of talk about how like one of the easiest ways to locate a garment is by having the listing of its color and then its sleeve type to find it quickly amongst other things and I thought that was really interesting. And then we just kind of go through a lot of different eras of sleeves and types of sleeves. Like they kind of first have this area where they talk about like basic types of sleeves and I took some different photos for inspo, but like they talk about like what's a kimono sleeve versus what's a mutton sleeve or a cap sleeve. They kind of just like talk about all the different patterning for that. And I enjoyed seeing the garments that they used to represent each of those, but it was like maybe less exciting for me in general. Then in the next room we go into to some sleeve structures from the 1830s and they actually show this beautiful green dress but then next to it they show some of the like undergarments and I never even thought about the fact that for them to get those really poofy sleeves they actually had to have like structure under those sleeves much like you would have like a corset holding the structure of a gown so I just thought that was really interesting and not something I had thought about previously in the sleeve exhibit just like they had a ton of like I feel like 1830s and then 1930s which makes sense any 1930s pattern I've made. The sleeves have been like the most interesting of all the patterns I've made. So it makes sense that they talk about sleeves a lot in that era. And there's just like a lot of variety of sleeves with like volume or fun or like there's one that like it's kind of like a play on a crayon sleeve that I think is really fun using the shaping of a sleeve to like represent and look like a crayon. Like I love that. That's so camp. I enjoyed there was like one that had like a bl two black dresses. One had like big poof on the top into a thin sleeve. So I guess you could maybe call that kind of like a Juliet sleeve but that's not quite right and then I like the piece behind it that the sleeves are so big my mind immediately goes to you could have a cat sling in each of those sleeves and I just always think that's really fun I loved there were like these rainbow like floor length sleeves and in front of it there was really interesting technology talking about how they're now using technology to show how some of these museum pieces would actually move when you walk and they had this as an example of it and I think that's actually a really interesting use of modeling to uh, like preserve clothing and just has something I didn't really think about. Gosh, I think this might be my favorite garment. It's like these beautiful, big, almost like doily looking sleeves into like a very cottage core slash coquette looking shirt. It's like basically a peasant blouse but definitely has some underlying structure to it. I am thinking of like how I could use like some of the crochet pieces I've been collecting to sew something like these sleeves. Like I definitely felt very inspired by these sleeves. This is a Givenchy piece from the 50s so well within my era and then I loved this is a piece by Adrian it's a black rayon crepe evening dress and I love the way like there's the slits in the sleeves and there's like these sequins and or rhinestones or whatever as well as the black stripes there's just there's a lot happening with the sleeve and I absolutely adore it and then next to it was this beautiful little 60s number with these feather sleeves I already have a project with feathers planned otherwise I would be making something like this ASAP uh, another example is this like kind of brown dress that has all of these interesting cutouts in the sleeve as well as like interesting shaping like this one here it's like a taffeta dress that has like a bunch of mesh like pleating in it it's very very interesting and I really wish I lived in a city that had more fashion exhibits like this because I do find them really inspiring I was also thinking about this like purple piece that I saw that like is basically a half circle with shapes cut out of it body and I just think that's so inspiring and cool it was also next to this like really old Victorian piece and I always kind of love the juxtaposition of like that modern and old and this piece I thought was really interesting because I I love what the fashion industry has been doing more with accessibility so in this case this shirt is designed for like a wheelchair user where they maybe can't like fully put on a shirt with sleeves it, 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 there's a way it blocks mobility so they made like these kind of sleeve separates and then you can take these sleeves and interchange them and have like a very different looking shirt each time and I feel like that combines both like an accessibility mindset with an environmental mindset because then you have a piece that like serves a ton of different purposes and then we have like more old garments 
I wish you could see in front of it, there's this terrible, it's a anthropology piece from um, Mauve or Maeve or whatever. It's fast fashion. That like was basically this way you could like put sleeves on anything, but behind it, is an exquisite 1930s dress with really, really, really interesting sleeves. And I wish I could photograph the dress behind it without photographing those ugly sleeves from Anthropology. And then the last piece that I'm gonna talk about with you all, it has these bows down the back. This was a fun example of like the sleeves and the bow collection I feel like mixing. Uh, so we'll end on that final theme. I will say, I don't think you could move in those sleeves, but maybe that's none of my business. But after that, I went and I headed to my first bit of fabric shops, which was pretty overwhelming. But uh, this was my last day of having to work and then go do things. So I have worked, I'm now done. I'm off the next two days and then obviously on Saturday. So we have three full days of exploring left to do. I guess before we jump into the footage of the next day, I'm just gonna mention, I planned on packing my schedule much more intensely this day. So this day my plan was to go to the Greenwood Graveyard and then go to the Brooklyn Botanical Garden and then the Weeksville Center and then Ellis Island. Turns out I should not pack all those things in a day. My body said, uh, no. I only went to the graveyard, the Weeksville Heritage Center, and then I went back up to the Garment District to try to spread out some of my shopping. So that is what we are going to jump into footage wise right now. All right, the next morning I got up bright and early to go to a cemetery like your normal person does. First I stopped for a bagel, to no one's surprise. Actually two bagels, I bought two bagels. I entered on the sunset entrance, which is not the main entrance. In retrospect, I might have preferred to enter on the main entrance, but this was like the best option given the subways I could take. It was a beautiful, bright and sunny morning and I didn't really read anything about the temperatures before heading out. So I am wearing a dress with no pants, leggings, anything to keep my legs happy. So I actually had pretty bad wind burn after my time in the cemetery because I walked around here for about three hours. I had initially planned to do the cemetery and then go to the Brooklyn Botanical Garden. But once I entered the cemetery, I could tell that I just wanted to spend the bulk of my time here and not rush myself. This is just a lot of me perusing the cemetery. I'm gonna just read off of Greenwood's website. Founded in 1838 and now a National Historic Landmark, Greenwood was one of the first rural cemeteries in America. By the early 1860s, it had earned an international reputation for its magnificent beauty and became the prestigious place to be buried, attracting 500,000 visitors a year, second only to Niagara Falls as the nation's greatest tourist attraction. Crowds flocked here to enjoy family outage, carried rides, and sculpture viewing in the finest of first-generation American landscapes. Greenwood's popularity helped inspire the creation of public parks, including New York City's Central and Prospect Parks. So it is 478 acres. I barely scratched the surface. There are like hills and ponds and lakes and just really, really cool graveyard cemetery stuff, I guess. I always come to cemeteries because of the art in cemeteries. I love the way people express things for the dead using headstones and the art that is involved in that. This cemetery has about 570,000 people buried here. There's some famous people here, but I don't really care about visiting famous people's graves, so I'm not gonna go over that. You can Google that and visit that if that's your desire. It is still a working cemetery. They're still burying people here, which I guess is kind of important to note. I will say they have a lot of really interesting climate-driven goals. They're talking about how they're gonna move some of their lawns to more wild flower fields to like help pollinators and stuff and I think that's all great this is beautiful this was an absolutely stunning stunning cemetery to walk around while wandering though I did stumble across the chapel of course it's really really beautiful inside uh, it was completely empty and also very warm I sat here for a while just warming up it has Christianity on the glass these are all Bible stories of Jesus and miracles and stuff but the space itself wasn't set up as Christian feeling. It gave me some refuge from the cold. The stained glass was stunning. The way these were, I don't know if they were restored to be this beautiful, but these were absolutely incredible stained glass. And if there is obviously not an active funeral happening, I highly recommend stepping in the chapel. And I believe the chapel has won awards for preservation. So that's pretty neat. But now back out to the cemetery. This is, I believe, a pretty unique area of the cemetery where this was to like kind of deal with Victorians being frightened of being buried alive so they kind of have like these weird catacomb thingies built into the hills so that way if you woke up you were in a room instead of underground you know victorians be victorianing there is nothing they were more afraid of it seems like than being buried alive maybe it's just because i'm a frequent cemetery
cemetery visitor. The other thing the cemetery really gave me was I saw maybe four people in the three hours I was here and given how overwhelmed I was feeling in New York this was really really peaceful and beautiful spot to come to to just kind of recenter myself and have some quiet. Like I said when I go to cemeteries I'm not like necessarily looking to see the sites or find the graves of the most famous people. Instead I'm just like really trying to recenter myself and morbidly like I feel like reminders of death and how short life is really help me recenter in some ways and really focus on being present in the moment especially while traveling. I also just think the way people treat their dead is fascinating. To have such a giant cemetery in such a giant city was just it's just really an interesting spot to be in. Of course I've done a beautiful job preserving this cemetery. This cemetery just had a lot of really interesting views because of the hills and stuff you could sometimes see the city and things like that like it's just it's truly a very 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 stunning place. If you need a break from the city and a break from people, highly recommend going here. If you love graveyards like I do, of course I recommend going here. This is definitely one of the most interesting cemeteries I have been in. Pretty much everywhere I travel I go to a cemetery because I'm just like that. Cemeteries are basically like free art museums is kind of my perspective. There's just a lot of symbolism but I did laugh because my my coworkers were like, what are you doing tomorrow? I'm like, oh I'm gonna go to a cemetery and walk around for a long time. And a lot of these people have lived in New York for a long time and they're like what? So I definitely know this is maybe not the norm but I honestly think visiting a cemetery is worth potentially becoming a norm because I just think it is such a way to ground yourself when you travel. But again I don't think I feel as much stigma towards death as maybe most people do. Like for me I'm very like accepting of the fact that one day I'm going to die which again kind of morbid I guess but I don't see death as morbid. I see it as an inevitability and a motivation on how you live life and that's kind of why I love cemeteries. This was one of my favorite monuments. This is Charlotte Canada's grave. I just looked up who she is. They have a whole story. So on her 17th birthday as she was returning home from her party she was thrown from a carriage. She died shortly after the accident. She was already designing a monument for her aunt and had sketched ideas for it on paper and her father took the design concept and personalized it for her. Oh, this is really interesting. I didn't know this story when I saw it. I just saw it and I saw it was absolutely beautiful. So super fascinating. The story behind that is really, really cool. To me, the fact that basically a woman designed her own grave and sketched her own grave out in the year 1845, who was 17 years old, is, is just like a really interesting story and the type of thing you're only going to find in a graveyard and you're not really going to find in your museums. No one in a museum is talking about a 17-year-old girl unless for some reason she is deigned extraordinary. And that's what I appreciate about cemeteries is you often can just find history you can't find other places. Although, of course, Charlotte Canada was clearly very 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 wealthy. This was another grave I loved. I particularly loved the like smattering of flowers around it. I'm not super sure about what type of flowers these were but I thought it was absolutely stunning. I know that this person and his wife were like an important founder of Brooklyn from reading about them. It just seemed like they were rich people who influenced things. Which of course to have a burial like this you had to be wealthy. The other thing that I just remembered is the Greenwood Cemetery. One of their missions is as a tree reserve. So there are tons of really really beautiful trees here. I think going here during the proper bloom would be absolutely stunning. I was more than happy to just enjoy the daffodils. I will say the East Coast and daffodils it's an intense relationship. I don't feel like I've ever seen so many daffodils ever. Uh, like Seattle there's a lot of daffodils but I feel like they haven't proliferated the way they have in the East Coast. Here is a really modern part of the cemetery. This is the Tranquility Garden. It was absolutely stunning. I didn't spend too much time here because I could see there was an active grave visitation happening and I just try to respect people who are respecting their dead. But I did want to point out all the really, 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 really cool koi fish in this pond. It's clear that people must feed them because they all swarmed when I came up. But look at how cool these are. This was just like vibrant and fun. I I love fish in a graveyard, I guess. Hadn't really occurred to me, but I do. And with that, I have made it to the big entrance of the cemetery. This is an absolutely stunning piece of architecture. I highly recommend going to the cemetery just to see this. It's absolutely gorgeous, super detailed. This was basically my exit from the cemetery, but I thoroughly enjoyed my time here. It was a nice break from the city. 
and I highly recommend a visit. Next up, I headed to Weeksville Heritage Center. Here is the outside of the homes. There's three homes here, ranging, I believe, from the 1800s to the 1970s and when they were occupied. This is a historically black neighborhood that I'll get into more about in a few minutes because I couldn't film inside the houses during the tour. And then finally, I wanted to get a view of the Statue of Liberty, so I went to the Battery to see it, and as you can see, there is construction going on, so all you can do is view it through these tiny diamond windows without paying a bunch of money, so I was a little bit bummed about that. But the rest of the park was beautiful. Here's kind of a view of the landscape, and there's this really beautiful merry-go-round in here. So this was fun to see, and I'm glad I came down here even if I couldn't really view what I wanted to view. Next up, we're headed back to the Garment District because, of course, we are. This is New York Elegant Fabrics, which I think was my favorite fabric store I visited. They also use header cards here in a header car system, but I feel even though in some ways it was less organized, it was a much more peaceful shopping experience. There were definitely just generally less people here. And I don't know, like, like this sounds rude, but like at some of the other shops, I was like feeling like I was getting mean vibes from the staff, but I didn't get any mean vibes from the staff here. So um, I thoroughly enjoyed my time here. I got picked up lots of fabric here. I think this is probably the shop I spent the most money at. And I came back to this shop another day because of a fabric I didn't buy. So I feel like that tells you everything you need to know about this shop. I also here was able to pick up a few fabrics for projects that I had already planned and sketched for this year. So this ended up being like the most successful shop for me. Next up was high trim and feathers. These are more feathers. I was just kind of looking at everybody's prices for feathers because I kind of already had an idea of what I was buying on Etsy. They did not have their ostrich feathers out in the main area. They were back behind the counters. So I could already assume they were more expensive than other things in the store. However, of course, I still enjoyed looking at it. I love feathers is I guess where I've landed. Also, if you're looking for blingy trim, this is another place for you. There was so many blingy trims and then a ton of rhinestones, which I did pitch, pick up some sew on rhinestones. If you are looking for some specialty things for a project, again, highly recommend this shop. And of course they also had kind of some different giant feathers for probably headdresses. Though I'm sure you could use these on pieces as well, as well as a bunch of different types of dyed peacock feathers. This was just quite a fun store to visit and I highly recommend visiting it just for the delight of colors before your eyes. And then I headed to Chic Fabrics. I didn't end up getting anything here. I did like how everything was like displayed like this, but because there was stuff up so high, I felt like I couldn't really touch without talking to people and asking questions. And I just felt like in general, this was just like way more decorative than I wanted. Although I didn't head all the way to the back of the store. And then my last stop for things was DMC Fashion and Fabrics slash Exclusive Fabric. You'll find them called both on the map. So they have a lot of interesting, you can see here a lot of like dress panels. That's not what I was looking for, but I thought they were interesting. Personally, like a dress panel is already too much of a design dress for me. I could hear a lot of people here on the phone with clients for prom dresses, which I thought was really fun. And then they did have just like an interesting variety of some silks, lots of brocades. They did have some planer cloth, but honestly, I preferred the way I could shop in other places for that. So I was kind of more checking out the gown fabric because I have a very specific specific vision of a gown I want to make in my head. And here was definitely like the most affordable prices that I found while out and about. So I was just kind of trying to think through some of these. I'm looking here this time. We will be back here tomorrow or the day after for me to actually pick up the yardages of what I ended up buying because a lot of what I was looking at was above like $50 a yard. So I just wanted to make sure I had a crystal clear example of what I was thinking of making from the fabric. I am just such a sucker though for sequins and lace and sparkle, so it was very, very hard to resist my urges to just buy everything willy-nilly here. So I didn't, I was good, but it was very, very challenging. All right, so I didn't get to talk much about the Weeksville Center because I didn't take much footage there because you can't film inside the houses or anything like that, but I did wanna talk about it a little bit more and why I chose to visit there because it's like a very niche thing to do. If you've been around this channel, you probably know that I'm obsessed with the working class. Most of us in history would have been working class just like most of us today are working class, and most of what gets preserved is what really, really, really wealthy people have left behind because they can like put money into foundations and museums to like protect their legacy and also because they're really rich and they can pour all this money in their stuff is thought of as more important to be preserved and also they can like afford to have multiple houses and things like that versus like working class living has to turn
turnover fairly quickly and have different people living there because we're working class we can't make museums to ourselves but I was really really excited to find two examples of like basically working class historical homes in New York Mikesville Heritage Center which I went to and it's really cool because basically it was historic center for black people in like pre abolition um, abolition I'm not saying that word, but pre the end of slavery in America. And it was basically a free town outside of New York. It was considered a little bit rural, but kind of a little bit like a suburb. And it was like this community that black people really built intentionally. They bought land and they like invested into themselves. They were along the train lines so they could commute in and out. It was just really, really cool. And everybody there, it seems like was pretty working class, but like middle class. And I think we see, especially like pre civil war, but just generally in history, we so see so little of working class black Americans. It was really cool to go see. I got a great tour by the tour guides. I talked a lot to the people in the center there and they were able to answer some of my different questions around New York. And it was just, it was a really great experience. I highly recommend them. The other thing I wanted to real quick mention before I move on, if you really like historical dolls, this place is a must visit. In the last house, which is, they have three houses that are each set up in a moment in time. Last house is set up in 1930s, so there's some really beautiful Art Nouveau type of furniture and stuff in there. But in that house, there are also, because they were upper middle class, you can tell that they were able to afford quite nice things. And one of the really, really, really cool things they have there is an example of three dolls that you can tell were manufactured as white dolls. But I don't know if it was someone professionally, like two of the dolls looked more DIY to make them black dolls. They had hair done and things like that, but their paint was very flat and stuff. But the last doll, that was an example of like, it was clear that this was like a huge like craftsman because the dolls, I mean, of course she was black now, but they had gotten the blush in her face her eye, like everything was just like perfect. They had clearly replugged the hair to have like tight curls. It was really, really, really interesting to see and definitely has alighted some questions in my brain about like, was there a whole segment of the economy in these middle-class black areas that were like taking these white dolls and making them into black dolls to then sell to black families? Like, I'm just very interested. So I'm probably gonna go down a rabbit hole at some point. But if you find like toy history really interesting, interesting and how like toy and race history intermingle interesting you have to stop just to see those three dolls like that sounds probably like a semi crazy thing to say the other thing is I think at least two of those homes there were seamstresses living there so there's some really great sewing things to look at so yeah highly recommend I mean I love I think in general if you can see historic working class homes you should because it really gives you more of an idea and a lens of where you would have sat in history. But enough of talking about Weeksville. You have to go, is my opinion. And we're gonna move on to our next day, which was my main day to fabric shop, and then later I'm gonna visit the Tenement Museum. So today to start my fabric journey, I got to Mood and I got there early from reading reviews, reading advice. They recommend if you don't want a super crowded store, you get there between nine and 10. And here I am in the coding section. I will say, I don't know if I would recommend getting there directly at nine because they were still very much like in vacuuming cleaning mode and I felt very overwhelmed by all the vacuuming and avoiding the vacuums. However, it was, as you can see, very empty. So if you do want a more peaceful shopping experience, this is definitely the way to go. And wow, this store, I had to be pretty selective. Like this is some really fun wool suiting. That's like great colors. Narrowing down what I wanted to buy here was really, really challenging, but I did obviously do it. Like here we're in like the cotton lawns and wall section, everything's to die for. So I had to be super selective and I'm really excited about what I did pick up here but yes mood is ginormous and I didn't take that long here I only took about an hour but that's just about how much I max out at any store thrifting or whatever is I can just basically only do about an hour shopping but before I left I wanted to be sure to show you my favorite section which is the hella expensive beaded fancy things section essentially one day I hope to use some of these really expensive fabrics to make a gown for myself, but today is not that day. So instead I'm just gonna give you a tour around. This is like a really particular section and I'm guessing everything in here from what I was looking at is starts at $250 a yard. Uh, so pretty insane, but absolutely stunning. And I loved a lot of these. So cool with so many th cool 3D elements and feathers and just lots of, lots of, lots of really, really fantastic stuff. 
but this is not for me where I am right now. Someday I want really, I would really like to save up the money to be able to buy something from this section. My next stop was my last trim specific store. This is East Coast Trimming Corporation and wow, oh wow, this is a must see. The shop itself is organized really, really beautifully, but also they have the most divine collection of like more antique and vintage things. All these ribbons were to die for, although I realized after I did this that I should not open the case like this myself and touch things, but wow, I also forgot some really 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 beautiful pieces here and the women running it they were a little gruff at first but once they saw that I knew the value of what I was looking at they got very excited to share everything with me and it was a really fun and cool experience and I just think New Yorkers are so much fun these next two stores were really really overwhelming and hard to shop for me personally as you can see it's like kind of claustrophobic it's really hard to get through this one I actually wish I went to before mood because I found some of the coating fabric that I bought at mood it was about maybe five dollars cheaper so you have to decide like is the dig and the like lack of ease looking here worth the discount at like shops like these these shops are definitely lower priced than somewhere like mood or new york elegant fabrics however it is like just a little bit more challenging so you have to decide if you're cool with that that is true for this fabric shop as well as you can see the aisles are insane however at this one they had some nice but this shop, once I asked what I was looking for, which I highly recommend in shops like these, he directed me to the silk charmooses and I did end up picking up some of these here because the quality was on par with some of the silk charmooses I found in Thailand and the price was pretty comparative to what it cost there. So that's just like my two cents, I guess, on these types of shops is definitely go and check them out, but like be aware that it's going to be significantly more challenging, especially for me as a neurodivergent to shop. And with me being thoroughly hungry, I stopped by Liberty Bagels, which is like a pretty famous bagel shop. The line was insane. I don't think I would go here again, but if you want like your rainbow bagel, it's a great spot for that. Hello, I figured, I guess I haven't really done a check-in since I've been here in New York, even though my intention was to do a check-in every evening. It just didn't happen. Today in the morning, I got to mood sharply at nine and I was done fabric shopping by 11 30 i definitely recommend spreading out fabric shopping if you get overwhelmed easily like i do so what i'm on day four and i'm feeling pretty worn out i think somebody asked me recently like what i do when i travel and like my body i say as i'm like slumping has issues and i was basically like oh yeah i usually ignore it ever since i got back to my hotel since uh going to mood and all that and carrying around some heavy fabric for a few hours both my arms are like too shaky to even use a keyboard also i had coffee so i don't know if that has to do with it so i'm feeling like not great and overall my brain is just feeling really overwhelmed i'm now on day two of only being able to eat bagels ironically which is nice being in new york bagels are like one of my safe foods so i've been eating like three bagels a day <laughs> because right now eating anything in a restaurant makes me feel overwhelmed and eating anything with like any texture or spicy flavor or I guess stuff like that is making me feel really overwhelmed. I'm just feeling very overstimulated at this point. So today I keep debating whether I want to book a 3 p.m. tour at the Tenement Museum, which I'm going to later to do one tour at. But I think the thing that would be kind to myself would be to just rest until my tour that's at 4.30 so I can head back into the city like 3.30 and walk around the area since it's in a part of New York I haven't been in yet. So I think that's kind of what I'll plan to do. The other thing that really stopped, I feel like it's at, at 11.30 when I left the garment district, I think I was feeling more energetic. But between carrying my bag and then I had my first bad New York subway experience, it wasn't that bad. I've definitely had worse bus experiences in Seattle. Sorry, my brain's kind of like, Ugh. best description of my brain right now. So basically what happened is the train I was on, someone was in the tracks in the next station, which given the announcements I've heard, it seems like people end up on the tracks and the subways in New York a lot. And I, I wanna be clear, nothing bad is going to happen. It's just, we got basically stuck until they cleared the tracks. No one got hit, no one got hurt as far as I know. So we love that. I was just minorly inconvenienced. And by 
by then my body was already starting to kind of freak out. It was a vibe. However, other than that, I will say uh, I would kill for a subway system like this and I would get rid of my car in three seconds if I had a subway system like this. Where was I going with all of this? Oh, that, that delay and just being stuck on a train like that and being like worried about like how long we're gonna be stuck and like is the person okay and stuff like that. Just, I feel like really sapped my energy. So I'm not thinking I'm gonna do two tours. I think I'm just gonna kind of rest up here for a bit, maybe do some editing and some voiceover work. And I did get a very touristy bagel because uh, I got, look at this. I got the rainbow bagel with the birthday cake cream cheese. So super ridiculous and I love it. Yeah, so I'm gonna eat that for lunch. Like I said, we're really highly nutritious right now. I'm hoping, my friend invited me over for dinner tonight, so I'm hoping going to dinner at her place and being somewhere that hopefully I'm not feeling as overstimulated will help me eat some vegetables because at this point my stomach is screaming for vegetables, but my brain is like, mm, I'm too overwhelmed and overstimulated for vegetables. But my body needs them. So uh, yeah, right now my body is just kind of, I'm kind of messed up right now, honestly. It's funny because in other countries, I feel like because I don't don't have like the option for a food like a bagel. I just push through it. I guess in other countries though, I've also had like a second person who can help me make some decisions. The other thing I'm feeling and I feel like resulted, I mean, I still purchased plenty of fabric and spent a lot of money, don't get me wrong, but I feel like I'm just like having a lot of decision fantigue. I'm really excited. To, so tonight I'm going to my friend's apartment for dinner so I don't have to make any choices there. And then tomorrow my friend is taking me to all her favorite vintage shops and she's planning everything. And that is just a huge mental load off because I have planned everything obviously while I've been here and I'm just like really tired of making decisions. Like I feel like I have decision fatigue and fabric shopping does not help when you already, like going into fabric shopping, I was having decision fatigue. And so going into such like an overwhelming situations uh, did not help my decision fatigue. So I'm excited that basically I don't think I have to make another decision while I'm here. So that's fantastic because I have this bagel to snack on. I had gotten two bagels this morning to have a bagel snack later before I saw the rainbow bagel with the birthday cake cream cheese, which are like two of my favorite things. I mean, I've never had birthday cake cream cheese, but I love birthday cake flavored things. I feel like I'm rambling. I feel like I'm off. I'm gonna do like a whole big wrap up. I feel like you can tell I'm overwhelmed. I like can barely even keep my eyes open right now. Travel is really, really fun, but when you're neurodivergent, I mean, I think in general it's really draining, but when you're neurodivergent, I don't know why I find New York so much more draining than Bangkok, but I do. I don't know if it's because like I can actually read everything. Yeah, so I should probably just sign off and get all my thoughts kind of like written out in an orderly note fashion so I can talk about it when I'm back home. But uh, yeah, that's kind of where we're at today. I just have the museum tour, which I'm so excited about. I think it'll be really cool. No, now I'm thinking about it, I'm definitely not gonna try to do two tours because the second tour is an hour. 15 I think and adding another hour of like standing and listening and seeing new things is probably not a great idea for me right now and like I think the fact that like right now basically all I can eat is bagels is a true sign of like how overwhelmed I'm feeling like I'm consuming a lot of sugar I also got this fun coffee from it's a place called Gregory's and they have it's called the cherry blossom drink I think I don't know it's a iced coffee with the cherry blossom syrup and I've been enjoying those but like I feel like I've been eating a lot of sugar. I am trying to make myself get one savory bagel a day <laughs> uh, to pretend that I'm not just eating sweets all the time. Like yesterday I got a sandwich at um, a deli that's across from my hotel and I couldn't even eat it because there were so many textures in it and I got really overwhelmed. So yeah, I'm just, I think I'm just like in a perpetual overwhelm state right now. So yeah, I think it's a good idea for me to just chill and watch some cable TV in my hotel. Yes, we are not done with the footage, but I just kind of wanted to give a little in the moment update, even though my thoughts are very not sorted. So um, yes, I will talk to you later. After taking a nap, I felt much better, and this is the only footage I got at the Tenement Museum, but I'm going to talk about it to you for a little bit because this was a really, really cool experience, and I highly recommend it. After, obviously, that little rant from being really tired, I'm really glad that I feel like what I learned from, like, my international traveling last year was, like, somewhere to land somewhere in the middle of resting versus being really busy. So I rested, I felt a lot better, and I got to actually really enjoy the Tenement Museum. I only have that little bit of footage, but I took the 100 
100 Years Apart tour. I think they have five tours. My goal is every time I'm in New York to do one of the different tours. So this talked about women 100 years apart and there were some really interesting choices there. So the first tenement you visit, which I learned a tenement, is basically just another word for apartment. The rule is I think it has to be more than three families under one physical roof. So I technically live in a tenement. We distanced ourselves from the word because we like considered it a poor and dirty word. Classic America. We went to the apartment of Mrs. Wong and this is actually also relevant to the Weeksville Heritage Center because they did this too. It was really interesting at both of these places with working class people. We're talking about people who were in these homes up to the 70s. So they actually worked with the people who owned and lived in these homes and their descendants to like respectfully talk about their relatives and I think that's really 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 cool. I don't feel like I've been to so many places where they're talking about like the active like living history and not like a distant rich relative type of way but in a like this person chose how she wanted her home defined. So in this case we're talking about Mrs. Wong. So Mrs. Wong came to America I believe in the 60s and became a garment worker in New York which is why I took the tour is both of them were garment workers just 100 years apart and of course I was really interested in that because we know I love talking about garment workers and unions and this tour really fit into that. I highly 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 recommend if you want a better understanding of unions specifically between the 60s and the 80s. I believe in the 70s is when the garment union was at the top of its power and you hear a lot of first-hand accounts from various garment workers who are in unions at this time talking about their experience with the unions and how the union protected like their benefits. The reason Mrs. Wong started working outside of the home is because her husband he had work but it wasn't work that came with health insurance so the only way they could get health insurance was if she was to become a unionized garment worker because they provided benefit as well as like paid vacation and all of that. I didn't even think about that part of like if you're a garment worker under a union because so often now garment workers aren't unionized and aren't able to have that bargaining power. If you are interested in garment production in America you have to go on this tour. I think the way they did it was very interactive and great. The other thing that I loved even though I would have loved to see the home more like authentically how it was in the 70s Mrs. Wong said she didn't feel comfortable having a bunch of strangers walk through her bedroom essentially that she shared with her husband and I think that makes total sense like I too would feel slightly embarrassed or weird about that so instead she asked that their apartment be made to look like a factory in Chinatown at that point in time because she said that she wanted her legacy to be about her work as a garment worker and also her union and like that's so powerful like it actually makes me want to cry thinking about it now because like she clearly took so much pride in being a garment worker and the way we treat garment workers is just really devastating to me because like, I think what they do is so cool and like so skilled and to hear these women talk about sewing together all day and the hazards of like it being loud and them getting like lint in their lungs and stuff like that like hearing them talk about that and also talk about the way the union like they threw picnics and all these different events and like her kids got to go to Niagara Falls because the union ran a bus for the Union's kids to go up to Niagara Falls and also to hear about these blends of culture and community where you would go to the Union picnic and you could go and try all these different cuisines from all these different cultures. It just it was so cool to hear about and it's like something it's something we're just really lacking today and I just like the fact that this woman wants this to be her legacy is just really cool. And I also love that she had four kids and three kids chose to also tell their stories as kids who grew up in this situation and there was one person who didn't want to be a part of that and the like museum was like yeah and I just think it's really cool I'm gonna get it back together but I just thought it was so cool and it's something I'm so passionate about that like yeah, this is like probably my top thing to do and then the second apartment was interesting but less so for me because basically it was the Gumperts family and this was 1880s is what this tenement was set up to see it was really interesting because it was really historical and really cool uh, but basically her husband went missing and she had to figure out how to make a living to support her I can't remember if it was two or four children a lot of children so she actually started dressmaking at home it was like not a factory thing there was no union it was definitely her supporting herself but it was really really interesting and again they talked about these communities in the way she could go to her neighbor downstairs and her neighbor would maybe watch the kids while she got something done and how there were kind of these communities because you're like outhouse and your water were out back so like you had to see and talk to your neighbors 
characters because you shared amenities. So I just thought that was both really, really interesting. And like I said, working class history is my bread and butter. I love it. If I ever do a historical costume, it will probably be around the working class. Ultimately, I would wanna make something practical for me every day, which means I'm interested in working class garments. After this, the next day, we are headed out vintage shopping. I went in relatively skeptical of <laughs> vintage shopping in New York because a lot of the shops that I had briefly popped into in my free time was really, really, really 90s focused. It's great that 90s are people's cup of tea, but I am not paying like $200 from a t-shirt from the 90s. I'm not doing it. So I was like kind of skeptical that there was going to be anything that fantastic because I had already kind of looked around, but I should have known my friend was going to come through for me because she and I were the exact same type style. We both love kind of that like historic hyper femme sometimes and sometimes not like aesthetic. So I should have known she would have come through with me and I was very impressed with these an these vintage shops. So we're gonna hop into that footage. So for today's adventure, my friend who lives here took me around to all her favorite vintage shops in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. So this is our first or second stop. I think I forgot to film at the first stop, but I loved the way this shop was set up and it was just so cute. And I liked the, all the little doodads because like I've become a lot pickier about the clothing I bring into my wardrobe. So it was super fun to get to shop slightly different things. This shop did have a bunch of vintage in the back and while it was all really, really awesome, it just wasn't quite what I was looking for for the prices they were selling it at. This next shop I think was by far my favorite. This is Stella Dallas Living. There's actually like two shops. This is like the more curated shop and there were so many really, really beautiful, really, really old pieces here as well as tons of like bedspreads, tablecloths, other textiles and fabric. Also like a fantastic purse collection like this shop was really, really, really fantastic. In my opinion, this is a must-see if you love vintage or antique pieces and you're in New York. And all things considered, this is still on the pricey side. Honestly, all of these are really, really expensive. None of the shops on this list would I recommend if you're looking to like thrift or find something on a budget. These are all pure vintage shops. Everything was marked pretty high, but this was more reasonable for what you were getting than some of the other shops I felt like we went into, which to be fair, some of the other shops had more modern pieces that were likely more like designery, and that's like not my specialty and knowledge. My specialty is really like decade-based and what you should be charging based on how old and in what condition something is. But I had tons of fun here and I did pick up quite a few goodies. And this is their sister store that is a little bit more affordable, quote unquote. Everything here was still pretty expensive but like you could find things for under a hundred dollars here and this had more like of the cute like 50s 60s 70s stuff besides gunny sacks which were in the other shop but definitely less curated really inspiring though this next shop had a lot of really, really cool things. I think it was more focused just in general on designer pieces, which is less my thing, but they did obviously have that beautiful chenille robe I showed and stuff like that. This is the only piece I tried on that I would have considered buying. It has a handkerchief hem and these fun handkerchief sleeves. However, it didn't zip up the back, but I think this is a great inspo try on for making something. And this shop here was really, really fun. It was like styled really fun. It was really fun to look at. I think overall this was the shop that was like the least to my taste, but there was still so many fun things to look at. And I did pick up something here. They had some really fantastic accessories and there was one that I couldn't live without. You really can't tell from this footage, but I was trying to show you this day was the worst weather it was pouring. I think it was said that we're going to get three inches in New York on this day. Stuff was flooding. We were soaked to the bone at this point, so we headed back to my hotel. I'm going to give you a little sneak peek of my haul. This here is all the good stuff that I hauled, but because of the pouring rain, most of it got wet, so I had to creatively use my hotel to try and get everything hung to dry overnight because I'm leaving on a flight at 7 a.m. So yeah, that was my trip to New York. Just kind of, I guess, like final thought. I loved New York. I could never live in New York, as I guess how I would summarize it. I was so overstimulated the whole time. I could barely eat for several days because I just felt so overwhelmed. I was having a really hard time making decisions because I felt like I was making so many decisions every day, but it was still great and I can't wait to go back. I think right now I'm hoping to go back to New York yearly because I was able to successfully source so many things for future sewing projects. Like I was able to, I think I just have one thing I have to buy now that like I couldn't find in the garment district at the price I knew I could buy it for online, but otherwise everything else I got in the garment district, 10 out 
out of 10, fantastic. I would like to be able to go to New York once a year with the sketches I have for some of the things that I'm working on and find my fabrics there, uh, as well as selfishly visit friends. I have two friends who live in New York and then one in Philly, and I have them kind of up and down the East Coast. So I think once a year, I wanna try to make it to the East Coast and see a few people while I'm there because it was so fun. As like overwhelming as New York was, I am very much feeling like more inspired again. I was kind of feeling in a sewing rut, not that you can tell because I'm still sewing, but I wasn't feeling like as inspired about what I was sewing for a little bit here. So now I'm feeling way more re-energized, refocused and ready to sew. It also was like effective for that. I think next time I will say I'm not gonna go in March. I wanna go more like proper spring because it was quite chilly and I don't feel like I brought enough warm clothing. <laughs> final, final thought also, I love the subway. I adore the subway. I would kill for a subway. Give me a subway. It was so easy to get everywhere. They came so often. You could just tap your credit card to get in. You didn't even need any sort of pass, but you could use a pass, which is great because for some people they need to have a pass that's more accessible for them. But for me, being able to tap my credit card was peak. It was great. I loved it. I loved the subway. I loved all the weird ads on the subway. I was gonna say I loved all the weird people on the subway, but that is not a fact. But I will say I experienced way less weird stuff on the subway in New York than I have experienced on the buses in Seattle. So huge fan. And they were on time because I didn't have to wait for any slow cars in my way. But with that, we're gonna wrap up this video. Like I said, I'm gonna have the hauls in future videos. So I'm going to have the garment district fabric haul out in two weeks. And then two weeks from that, I'm gonna have what I brought back from the vintage shop. I spent a lot of money on this trip to New York, so I gotta make the content last as long as possible and also make as much sense as possible for the algorithm, so that's why it's so spread out, is I wanna do that, but I also still wanna give you guys sewing videos because ultimately that is what I love creating the most. That is the plan. I will see you in those future videos. Subscribe and stick around for them. I would love to have you. And as always, you can like this video or comment down below to help boost it or whatever. I will see you next week for a sewing project at Friday at 8 a.m. Pacific time. Bye.